Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, watch escapement to me is uh, it's one of those things that I, when I went to school uh, the first time, uh, didn't really understand when I got out of school. It's not that we didn't cover it, but we, we just, I don't know, maybe it had something to do with the way that we did it or whatever. And so that when I actually did learn the escapement, I was really uh, stuck with me better or whatever. Um, and, I, and I learned it more when I got into teaching. Uh, they say if you can't do it, you should teach. Well, that's kind of the, the backwards way of looking at things, you know. I really think that uh, when you teach, you really learn a lot about things because they talk about kids saying the darndest things. Well, students will ask the darndest things, too. So, and you usually want to come up with an answer for them. Um, and I was lucky enough that when I first started teaching, I was here in the Cincinnati area, taught at the old Gruen Watchmaking Institute, which had uh, been donated to uh, Goodwill after the Gruen family sold the, the watch company. And um, my students started asking questions about the escapement. And one of the first things uh, I did was call AWI. You know, what do I need to do? So they sent me. Uh, <clears throat> Henry Freed's watch repairs manual, the green book, where you learn how to draw the escapement and all this. And, uh, oh, I just loved it. I mean, it was unbelievable the things that I learned from, from drawing that escapement. Uh, but there are still some unanswered things that, that uh, I didn't know. And it wasn't really till I went to Wostep when they were simplified it so well that, that it's given me the opportunity to, to pass this on to you guys. So anyways, the, even though the escapement is a situation that you don't see in all watches, you can develop some quick check ways that you can uh, eliminate it from the possibility of being a problem. It might only be a 5 or 10% situation, but when you're trying to be efficient, making money, making a living, uh, you don't want to have to do the job a second time. And the, 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 more, the more those types of uh, mystery comebacks that you can eliminate, uh, the better off you're going to be. <clears throat> so anyways, the, before we even get to the escapement, there's some things that we need to talk about as far as proper cleaning. We're not going to go through that, but the watch needs to be properly cleaned. You need to make sure, uh, especially nowadays with the, uh, the old automatics wanting to come back, for, uh, for restoration, I guess you would say now, or repairing them when I was uh, working in the stores, but now I guess you would call it restoration on a lot of these things. Barrel wear is very important. A lot of people miss barrel wear. Uh, proper uh, uh, adjustment of the barrel arbor to the barrel, barrel arbor to the plates. Uh, proper lubrication of the, uh, of the bridle for the mainspring. And then, of course, the, the train has to be nice and clean and free. Uh, one of the things that people miss a lot on some of the 17, older 17-jewel watches, the, the lower center jewel or lower center pivot was not jeweled. And there's a lot of wear there. And the, and the, 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 uh, uh, the high uh, torque there or high uh, uh, contact with the center wheel pinion from the barrel pushes that center wheel uh, arbor over, and, and if you've got a worn hole, that's, a, that's, a, loss, that's a, a, a big loss of power there that you can experience. So before you even look at the, at the escapement, you've got to make sure that these certain things are correct. Backlash in the train and all those, that kind of stuff. So anyway, so then we get to the escapement, and we want to check to make sure that things are functioning properly. And before we get too deep into that, we should probably talk about some of the, uh, the, the, the terms that go along with it. Um, when the watch doesn't have any power on it, which I'll have to use my finger here to get this positioned exactly correctly. So that, there we go. What do we call this position? If we, if we were looking, you're talking about the, the right thing, but it's not exactly the term that I'm looking for. Well, we're, if, we, if we were to, to compare, if we were to look at this, well, in fact, you know, I'm going to do this exactly the way we want to do it here. Let's let the power off all the way. Watch, it doesn't have a beat regulator. Before we start timing it, there's no power on the watch. You can see the escape wheel's not contacting the pallet stone. 
So a dead rest, or it's, it's, it's the, uh, uh, it's, it's in beat, the watch is in beat, okay? It's, it's dead rest, it's in, it's in beat. Uh, there's two types of beat, static, dynamic. This is static, static. There's, it's not moving. So first thing you want to do is, is uh, make sure that the watch is, is uh, statically in beat. Hairspring positioned properly on the balance wheel, roller table properly positioned on the staff. Okay, then when we wind the watch up, let's see, get my little laser pointer out here. Well, let's just talk about general terms here first. These, this is our escape wheel, complete pallet fork, roller table complete, double roller, with roller jewel. These are the escape wheel teeth. And then when we start talking about the different portions of the escape wheel, what's the, the lead edge? Locking surface, impor, impulse surface. Other thing we'll talk about is the locking corner and let off corner. Then on the pallet stones, we have locking surface, Impulse surface, locking corner, let off corner, pallet arbor, pallet stones, more specifically, entrance or receiving, exit or let off. Up here we're looking at the uh, uh, pallet fork shank to the fork slot guard pin, what are the things on the side here, fork horns, roller jewel, which when we talk about shapes, there's uh, what, three main different shapes you could have, and the, the, actually the, the one that you see 99.9% .9 of the time is this one, which is called a D-shape roller jewel, and then of course we have the, uh, the I mentioned the roller complete with the safety roller, impulse roller, and what's this section in here called? Crescent. The crescent, very good. Okay, now we wind the watch up and the power of the mainspring transferred down through the train of the wheels causes the escape wheel tooth's impulse surface to strike on the impulse surface of the pallet stone causing impulse to take place, which is the fork slot striking the side, the edge of the roller jewel and causing it to be forced out of the fork slot on its mission of uh, uh, travel. And when the roller jewel stops at a certain point and comes back to the fork slot, what do we call this, uh, uh, what should I say the action here? What's how? What's what is this that we measure? What's that called when it's amplitude? amplitude okay, we want to have a certain amount of amplitude. Hey Tom, how you doing? The uh, and while this is taking place, at the same at the other end, we've got our impulse that takes place. At the moment that we have the two let off corners part, and we have contact here. What's that called? The action is drop the moment it touches is lock, correct? Okay, so we have drop lock, then slide, and then when the pallet fork reaches the banking pin to the deepest point of the lock, what are we, and slide is over, what's that called? Total lock. So we have impulse, drop lock, or drop to a lock, it's a little more descriptive, so I'll say drop to a lock, slide, and total lock. Okay, hairspring pulls the roller jewel back towards the fork slot, striking the, uh, the uh, fork slot, the horn, so that the uh, pallet can unlock. We have unlocking, then what? Impulse to a lock, slide, not much slide on that one, and uh, total lock. Okay, 
A couple other things we want to check or that we want to talk about as far as terms go. Roller jewel in the slot. Got a little hair hanging off of there, don't we? Better change that cleaning solution, huh? Where is that? Okay, anyways, this situation right here, jewel pin freedom, corner clearance first, then we get out here and we're looking at four corn, guard pin, okay? Circular test, which what are we testing when we talk about the circular test? Correct, and when does that get out of being concentric? What's that? Or heavy hand when someone restaffs it, they don't <laughs> use the proper punch on an Inca block staff um, or Inca block rollers. Everybody know the difference between a regular double roller and an Inca block? It's got the little lips curved up on the bottom of it and uh, lots of times uh, people will forget about that and they'll smash that and knock the, the roller out of round. Okay, so I think we're pretty good on the terminology <laughs> here now. So the next thing we want to do is we want to adjust the escapement. And lots of times, the, most of the times, the first thing people will do is they'll look at the, uh, the pallet stones. Oh, let's adjust the escapement. You know, the first thing we've got to do is get in there and start cranking on the pallet stones. Well, we really don't want to do that. Well, this little line here in the, in the screen even helps to, to divide that. First thing you want to do is start on the opposite end. We want to make sure that when we're all done, that everything's on, that the, comes from the line of centers, and that uh, uh, everything is in sync with the, the roller jewel end as well as the pallet fork end. So if you have ba movable banking pins, which drives me nuts whenever I worked on a pocket watch and you always could tell that one banking pin was turned out more than the other or you had the, uh, the, uh, just the lone pin sticking up and one bent out more than the other. Uh, drove me crazy. You knew you were in trouble when you saw that situation. But if you have a, uh, uh, the movable banking pins, you want to move your banking pins in to their, to the center as, as close as they can be. Now I haven't set this as far as my jewels, so maybe I should back my stones off here so we don't have any run into any problems. Yeah, it's the woe step. Yeah. Yeah, the one that I saw was the one eight years ago that was uh Barkus? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they didn't have the, uh, it's not powered either. This one's really nice because yeah, it's well, powered. Nice. So the first thing we want to check is we just want to double check that roller jewel to uh, fork slot freedom. Textbooks say it should be two hundredths of a millimeter. Of course, that's going to vary on the size of the watch. Main thing is roller jewel, you want to be able to feel that freedom and the roller jewel to be able to exit the fork slot smoothly. If you have too small of a roller jewel, what can happen to the watch? Yeah, you have low amplitude. You lose too much of your strength by the time the fork slot strikes the roller jewel. Okay, so our roller jewel fits in the fork slot. The next thing we want to do is we want to check, make sure the banking pins are straight in all the way. Then we go to four corn clearance. We want to make sure that four corn clearance is going to allow the roller jewel and the four corns to have their safety action. Okay. Now naturally in a watch you can't measure that or can you really see it but you can feel it. And usually it's about you want to move your balance wheel about 45 degrees from the rest position to feel that. 
We have a back 45 degrees and then 45 degrees the other way and feel it on that side. And you want to feel that to make sure that it's equal on both sides of the line of centers. If it's not, then you want to open your banking pins, whichever banking pin you need to open. Well, if you open one, you want to open the other one the same amount because you're starting from, from the center position, okay? So we have our banking pins adjusted. I'm going to back them off just a little bit just because I've used this model enough. I know that I'm going to need to. Come back after you make your adjustment and make sure that your four corns have equal four corn clearance. Very important that you have equal four corn clearance. Now, if you didn't have equal four corn clearance, what could the problem be? Talked about the banking pins not being straight, or one turned out further than the other. So the horn could be bent. Roller jewel could be crooked. That's pretty much it. Now those, all those problems are eliminated. We don't have to think about those problems ever again. We go on to the next adjustment. We don't think about banking pins anymore. We don't think about four corns anymore. We're done. We don't think about roller jewel anymore. Those things have all been eliminated from the equation. Then we turn the balance wheel 90 degrees and we feel for clearance, which that's pretty tight. 90 de or, yeah, 90 degrees on the other side and we feel for that to be equal. I'm going to go ahead and open that just a little bit more so you can actually see the space. Equal amount on both sides. Are you judging for the guard pin clearance on the safety roller? Correct. Guard pin clearance is next. Four corn clearance and guard pin clearance. 45 degrees, well, you still can't see that much. It's 45 degrees over here, or 90 degrees, I'm sorry. And again, the most important thing is that it's equal. You want the same thing taking place on one side of the line of centers as it does on the other side of the line of centers. Okay, so that's our guard pin clearance. If that wasn't equal, what would the problem be, or what could the problem be? Well, we talked about banking pins being okay, roller jewel being okay, four corns being okay. Right, the guard pin itself could be bent one way or the other. Right, tip might not be a, a guard pin situation we need to look into. And Greg mentioned one earlier. The, the Exactly right, the roller table might not be concentric. And then if you wanted to, well, we, wouldn't, we couldn't do that test at the moment. Okay, so now we've got everything on the upper half of the escape wheel. We've got it all centered with the center of the, the balance, okay? Everything has to be relative to the, to the balance center. Four corn clearance is equal on both sides, and it, and it works. I mean, four corn clearance, the jewel and the four corner are contacting and the guard pin clearance is, uh, the guard pin's contacting the safety roller and it's equal on both sides of the line of centers. Um, all right, so now we can look at the pallet stones. Can I ask a question? Yes, fire away. Actually, there could be two pieces of plain consistency problems here. Could there not? One with the, uh, one with the jewel, mm -hmm. more so on that end, and, and the other with the roller table itself. Sure, yeah, roller table itself, exactly right. So there's two possibilities. Two possibilities, that's correct. Usually the one piece is going to be affected by the other, so you'd have to replace the whole roller table anyways. Um, I Myself, someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I've ever seen an impulse roller that had a problem. It's always been the, the safety roller that's had the problem. Okay. That's true, yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, yep. Okay. Yes, sir. We didn't address, we haven't really seen that end, but you also have a condition where the side of the 
So you're talking about the uh, the, 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 the the side to the side shake of the palate of the uh, balance staff in the in the uh, jewel. Well, that jewel or the palate. Or the palate. That's correct. Okay. That's true when you actually get the power up. That's a good point. Very good point. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm presuming that everything is, is, is good to that point. Okay. All right. Um, if, put it this way, if I knew, if, if a watch came in and I noticed that the banking pins were turned or whatever, I would probably do this before I put that. No, I'm saying, you're teaching the students. Uh-huh. class, where you would have this, and you said, here, you disengage the, uh, the duel. We're not going to do that. Oh, okay. Now, they, in school, they have them out. They're removed. Yeah, they're watching, take at least three. That's right. Uh, the, the pallet stones are out of the way. No, Oh, you can leave it in. Yeah, you can leave it in. Right, exactly right. Yeah, no, they'll they'll uh, they'll move it out of the way. Yeah, you're not going to hurt anything. But no, in the, in the classroom, we'll have them build it up from nothing, and we'll have them remove the pallet stones completely. But when you're actually, you know, when you're doing the check and the watch, you don't want to have to take your pallet stones out to check the upper end. You want to be able to just quickly do your checks and, okay. All right, so now we're ready to start talking about the pallet stones. And what's the rule of thumb uh, when we talk about either the amount of drop lock or the amount of total lock that the pallet stones should have? Third, when we talk about total lock, sometimes I've seen it referred to as a sixth when you're talking about drop lock. So in other words, drop lock might be half of total lock or total lock might be twice as much as drop lock. Okay? So... And the other thing that I've noticed that when, in most of the modern Swiss watches, is this part, the, the back, the, the, the heel, I guess you could call it, of the escape wheel tooth, that amount that's right there is almost exactly what your amount of total lock should be. So if you take, put a little bit of power on here, some more power on there. Get my pallet stone back out. There's I want this amount right here. I'm up against my banking pin, so I'm at the total lock position. We want this overlap here to kind of match this back part. Now this isn't, that isn't true in this model, but I'm saying in real life and a lot of the modern uh, escape wheels, this little back portion of the heel or the, uh, the toe of the escape wheel tooth actually is uh, usually is a, is a good gauge to go by for starters anyways. So now we want to go with about a third of the overlock. That might be a hair light, so I'll go ahead and make that just a little bit deeper. How many watches have those knives? No, yeah. That's yeah, too bad, isn't it? Yeah. Now, you notice I've got my third, one third total lock set, and I try to go through the impulse to drop to total lock to the opposite side and we got a problem here. It won't, it won't let off. Alright, so now we have to go back to the banking pins and kind of recheck our clearances. Remember what we do to one side, if we open this enough
the clearance problem because we didn't have our banking pin open wide enough to accommodate what the jewel's going to have to be. We'll fix it here. I'll show you. Not a there. And what's that called? Bank to a drop in the textbooks. But now we move this banking pin. So if we come back up here to the top and we check our four corn clearance, we've got this amount here. But now, look how much we have on this side. So we want it to be equal on both sides. So we come back to this banking pin and we have to open this banking pin up. So that we have approximately the same amount, not approximately, exactly the same amount on both sides, okay? All righty, so now we can go ahead and we can set the lock here. Notice we don't have anywhere near the one-third that we talked about, okay? So we want to push that stone out. No, Wes, I don't think I've ever really paid any attention to it. Looks like that might be a hair heavy. Back this one off just a little bit. Whoops. Okay, now, so the three basic things that, we, that we're looking for, and, and, and remember, this is only in a pocket watch situation when you have movable banking pins. The three main things you're looking for are four corn clearance, equal on both sides of the line of centers, guard pin clearance, equal on both sides of the line of centers, and total lock, equal on both sides of the line of centers. And the last thing that we want to check for is how do we tie the two together, the two ends, the roller side to the pallet side? What is the, what should I say is the, if a watch receives a jar and a roller jewel is Say the watch receives a jar, and you take it, and you look at a watch, and it comes in, and it's, and it's got this situation where the hairspring is holding the roller jewel tight up against the banking pin, out of action. What usually caused that? Well, but we already. Uh, there was a failure in the safety action somewhere, whether it was four corn or guard pin or whatever, the things that we talked about earlier. But the point is, is that there was a failure in the safety action. Oh yeah, thousands of different problems that it, that it could have been. But so what my, my point is, is that what ties the roller side of the escapement to the pallet stone is safe lock. Okay, so we have to have equal total lock, equal four corn clearance, equal guard pin clearance, but the total lock has to be not only equal, but it has to be safe. So the next thing we want to do is we want to come back and actually put power on the watch. And when we go to check our banking pin, or our, our four corn clearance, say the watch receives a jar, do we lose our lock? Okay. Do we still have lock? Then with the power on the watch, draw causes the pallet fork to come right back up against the banking pin. And that should be on both sides. You want to have safe lock, so we want to make sure we have equal guard pin or four corn clearance, equal guard pin clearance, and equal total lock, and then safe lock. So those are the four main things we're looking for.
Now, the other thing that I didn't mention yet is what's the relationship when you're talking about four corn clearance to guard pin clearance when we talk about the amount? Should one be more than the other, less than the other, equal? It should be equal. Well, they can be equal. Well, if we take and we put the roller jewel here and we look at the space between the four, excuse me, the four corn and the roller jewel, or we move the roller table here and we look at the space between the guard pin and the safety roller, what's that space? It doesn't have to be the same for any reason. Doesn't have to be the same for any reason, but guard pin should be less than four corn clearance. Less than probably. Right. Now, lots of times in real life they're equal. But if you have a choice, you want the guard pin to be less than the four corn, okay? Well, in the usual sense, there are things that find parlays or safety pins to get the best play, and so we're getting more from the small roller to the, to the safety. We get, we're getting um, more clearance from one side or the other. And it's just a matter of clicking up the... Correct, yeah. A lot of times that's... Sure, practice. yep, that's a high, high percentage play. Uh, Sure, that's correct. Okay, so we make sure that we have our, our uh, and so that's why we don't have to go and check the guard pin clearance again. Okay, we already checked the four corn clearance that make sure that it was equal on both sides, the guard pins equal on both sides. If we wanted to, we could have compared the guard pin to the four corn to make sure that guard pin was less than four corn clearance, less than or equal to, then do the the uh, equal total locks, and then the safe lock check. So those four things, four corn clearance, guard pin clearance, equal total lock, equal and safe total lock. Make sure you go back and make sure that it's a, a, a safe lock. Those four it's things. It's a thumb safe. Mm -hmm. You correct it by moving the thumb. <clears throat> well, if it's unsafe, you want to go back and check the amount of your stones. If you have movable banking pins, you might want to <coughs> check the amount of your four corn clearance to make sure. Point is, you want all your tolerances to be the, the least amount as possible. And what is it that we're fighting in, in mechanical timekeeping all the time to, be, to have a consistent rate? Friction, okay? So when we're talking about friction, and we talk about generalities of the total lock being one-third of the impulse surface, in reality, your watch might be able to have a quarter of that. You know, instead of the one-third total lock, you might be able to have one-quarter of that. But if you have one-quarter, you still have to make sure that you have the safe total lock arrangement. Okay? So, the, the, the point is, is that you want all your tolerances to be as low as possible or as small as possible, but at the end of the day, it still has to be safe. Safe four corn clearance, safe guard pin clearance, safe total lock. Some of your high grade watches, never been that lucky to work on a whole lot of them, you know, they might have less than the one third total lock coming right out of the factory. You know. Yeah, your high beat, I've noticed, have a, have a lighter lock. The other thing on your, uh, this uh, escapement model is based on an 18,000 beat watch where you have, well, according to the textbooks, you have a 103 degree angle here on your, from your locking surface to impulse surface and 115 on this side. Uh, and it's, uh, but on your high beat, they all have the, the steep angle the, these two jewels are basically interchangeable. They've got the, exactly the same angle, impulse angle there. The other thing we could talk about too is the different types of escapement over the kind of the evolution of the escapement, the lever escapement. There was, uh, when, they, when they first designed the escapement, they had what they called a, a circular escapement, the lever escapement, which from the Pallet Arbor Center, to the locking corner of the entrance jewel and the pallet arbor center to the locking corner, no, wait a minute, no, 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 no. 
The circular was to the exit corner. And if you were to draw, if you were to take your compass point here, put your pencil lead here, and draw a line all the way through, it would intersect the locking corner of the entrance and the let off corner of the exit. And then the let off corner of the entrance to the locking corner of the exit stone. So you had two circular, two arcs right here like this and like that. Well, what happens is, is that because this corner was further away from the pallet center than this corner was, you had a stronger impulse here than here because of the lever arm action that was taking place. So you'd get a real strong impulse from here, and then on this side you'd get a weaker impulse, so you didn't have equal amplitudes. And then you had unlocking problems where since you had a stronger lever arm from here to here, the unlocking was harder on this side than it was on this side. So then they thought, well, we need to fix that so that the impulses are equal. And they came up with the equidistant escapement where they placed it, which is what this one is, I believe. You can see the arm is quite a bit longer on the pallet fork where the locking corner of the entrance jewel is equidistance from here as it is from the locking corner of the exit stone to the pallet center there. So then when you draw an arc, it comes from here and goes through this here. So you have the same, you have the same strength of impulse on both sides. And then also, uh, but then what happened is, is that then, then the unlocking portion, this lever arm is quite a bit longer than this one. So this one here uh, would unlock easier than what this one did. So then they came up with a, with a compromise. They came up with a semi-equidistant where they took about the first quarter of the impulse surface of each stones and they put those equidistant from the pallet center and that's kind of where, they, where they've settled. They've taken a compromise of the, of the two. Yeah. Yes? I saw a statement that was like the first one you said. Were they earlier watches? The, yeah. Yeah, those would be your real early lever. Yeah, they were still club teeth, yeah. Yep. Okay, let's see. All right, so now we've got this watch all serviced properly. It's been cleaned. We've got our barrel adjustments taken care of. We've got our um, uh, center wheel. If we didn't have a jewel there on the bottom taken care of, the jewels aren't cracked. They're all nice and clean. Pivots are nice and got a nice uh, finish to them. Trains nice and free, escapements adjusted properly, and now we can go ahead and, and uh, time this watch out. So since we have a little bit of time, let's talk about some, uh, some things that you would look for in, in, the, uh, in, in timing a watch out, which would be, let's Sure, yeah. The question was to clarify lift angle. What is that standard? 52 yeah, 52 degrees is the most common lift angle. And the way that is measured is from the moment the roller jewel contacts the edge of the the uh, fork slot, you draw a line from, let me think now, it's been a minute, it's been a while since I talked about this, from the roller center through that intersection, okay? So it would be from the roller center through this point right here, and a line would come down. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm thinking while I'm talking here. Then the impulse or unlocking impulse would take place. And in the moment it lets off, you draw another line from the roller center through the roller jewel like that. And that angle is your lift angle. That's correct? 
52 degrees. So the moment the roller jewel contacts the fork slot to cause unlocking to take place, and the moment that it separates from the roller jewel to exit the fork slot to start the amplitude or disconnect from the escapement, draw your other line and that's your angle of lift. Right. Uh, yeah, that's a great definition. And, and where I have problems with that is, is that when you draw the lever escapement with Henry Freed, he, he talks about the, the pallet fork and the, and the contact that the pallet fork is in, in with the jewel. And that's 10 to 12 degrees on an escapement. And so you have to think of it, I had to think of it differently. So, but anyways, yeah, that's your angle of lift. Okay? All right. Okay, so now we have this finely tuned watch and we're ready to start timing it out. Before we get too excited about dynamic poising and positional errors and stuff like that, we want to make sure that our hairspring's adjusted properly. This one, now I know, I realize nowadays you have these frictioned on, glued on things that uh, are, are, can be a real problem sometimes, but the main thing is is that you have your, uh, your collet and your hairspring positioned properly so that the, the, since the hairspring isn't a perfect circle, that the, the body of the hairspring is centered around the, the balance staff. Now one way of checking that is if you need to is to take it off, take your balance off the bridge and put it in truing calipers and spin it and look for those coils to kind of explode. Like if you drop a rock in the, in the pond or whatever, you can see the, the rings disperse to the outer edge. <clears throat> but the main thing that I use this for is you, a lot of people, when they see hairspring problems, they don't, rec they don't understand where to go to make the, the correction. And like if you have a hairspring that looks like the, what I could describe as a fish flopping out of water, what type of a problem do you have? inner coil or, or hairspring to collet, right? That's usually right at, the, at a collet adjustment. Or if you have a jerky hairspring, when it's, uh, when it, as it, as it uh, contracts and expands and you've got a jerky action, it could be at your, you know, right, out of center at the collet. So I just wanted to use this to, to describe these. And of course then, you know, it's a matter of coming, say from a situation like that, and a lot of people will try grabbing when they're adjusting hairsprings they'll grab and twist as opposed to just a nudge with one edge of their tweezer you want to and, it's, and since the hairsprings are delicate of course I always I always uh, am an advocate for touching as opposed to grabbing so I just wanted to mention that okay then the next thing we want to do is we want to time it out in the Dial positions first. The ones that are pinned or glued? Well, I mean, if it's out of if it, if it's out of uh, rounds, you're going to have to, right? Okay, so anyways, the next thing we want to do is we want to wind the watch up in, our, in, a, in a horizontal position or dial down position. And what kind of amplitude should we look for in a watch? 270? Yeah, 270 degrees at full wind. 270 plus, maybe uh, really nothing higher than maybe 3 or 310 probably max. So then we would do our, our regulation to our, you know, zero to ten degrees, however you regulate them. Some people like to regulate them maybe ten, or I shouldn't say degrees, ten seconds, two to ten seconds fast, however you regulate your watches. And then we want to flip it over into the dial up position. And we want to compare that, bless you, um, to our reading from before. And if your dial positions aren't exactly the same, what can we look for? 
Pivot problems would be one. Cupped hairspring. Okay. That would be a low percentage problem, I would think, but yeah. Right. If you were to restaff it. <clears throat> what else? Is maybe a simpler problem. Pivot, jewel, and straight oil. Those are usually your three that you're going to want to check for horizontal positions. Pivot problem, which would allude to kind of what you were talking about with the side shake, possibly. That might come in more to play in the in the uh, in the hor or in the vertical positions. Um, so then we would make sure that we had uh, uh, pivot because the the amount of friction, one pivot surface area that it covers on the jewel compared to the other, one might be pointed is going to be unequal, so it would would run faster in the one that had the more pointed position or pointed pivot or with less, uh, with less oil is going to be less friction also. So then we would fix that and then we'd come back to our uh, uh, pennant positions because now we're ready to go into the, uh, the, the vertical timing and just do a test run to see what we get and say pennant up, pennant down, pennant left, pennant right and see what our, our, our differences are. If they're out of whatever the parameters are that we're looking for, then you want to lower your uh, amplitude to 200, less than 220 degrees. The rule of thumb is, is that if you have 220 degrees, of, if you could keep a watch running at 220 degrees amplitude all the time, you'd have no positional errors. That, uh, those, uh, at 220 degrees, it compensates for the roller jewel contact with the escapement and uh, just the, uh, the, uh, the weight of the balance wheel wouldn't have any, any effect at all. So you want to lower your uh, uh, amplitude to 180 degrees to help magnify any of the, uh, the, the, the poise errors. And some of the high grade watches, they suggest doing it at 160 to magnify it even more. Okay, so say this is our crown here. Say our balance wheel is over here. Which means that the balance cock would come over something like that. Okay, so we, we have our 180 degrees amplitude. And we want to time the watches in eight positions. Just for using the stem as a reference, stem up, and then say about the 130 position, 3 o'clock, 4.30, 6, 7.30, 8.30, that stem's getting longer and longer, isn't it? And uh, 10.30. Take those readings in all eight of those positions, compare them. The rule of thumb then is the heaviest spot will be your fastest position. So you go to your fastest position, say, let's say this one is our, say this is our fastest position down here. Now the next part is the most confusing, is now we want to identify this on the, on the balance wheel so that we take the weight off in the exact spot that we need to remove the weight from. A lot of people will put it back up into this position where you start and then take the weight off the bottom. You have to remember that when you timed it out, your crown was down here, so then this is, say, the, when you're in this position, and that means it's just the direct opposite, your balance wheel is up here, your balance bridge is over here like this, so then you let the power off the watch, 
put it back in the exact position where you had your fastest position, your fastest uh, rate, and then that lowest point on your balance wheel is where you remove the weight. Okay. Some different tools you can use. Of course, if you have screws on the balance wheel, you've got uh, the undercutters, which are a real nice way. You don't see the the uh, the weight that you removed. It doesn't. Uh, you can't see it anywhere, and that and that's probably the best. Other than that, if you had to do it in a lathe, but there's all kinds of other ways that people have invented to do it. And then, of course, yes. Sure, to do the opposite. If, if, you, if, if heavy is fast, then the, the uh, slowest is going to be light. Okay, so if you wanted, you could. If you wanted to try, you could put a washer on the top. That's exactly right. Reverse. Exactly right. And speaking of reversing, in order to save time, the watchmaker winds the watch up, and you have your 270 plus degrees amplitude. You can do your dynamic poise at your higher amplitude, and then your, re your rules just reverse again. Fast is slow then, or I'm fast as slow. Fast is light in that p situation as opposed to fast uh, being heavy. Fast is light, yeah, fast is light. Now, so many of the watches nowadays have... Uh, screwless balance wheels, the good way to remove the weight on those is uh, there's a nice tool that's available from one of the uh, supply houses that's a, a carbide tip that fits in a screwdriver, has a swivel head on it, but you could also, uh, what is it, uh, I think it's Manhattan Supply that you can buy carbide blanks from, and you can buy it in the exact millimeter size to fit in one of your screwdrivers, and then make a, uh, uh, a small countersink <coughs> so you have your uh, screwdriver blade if we're looking at it sideways something like that if you take and Grind that down like that, and then of course after these are removed, you want to put your edges on so when you look at it from the top, it looks like a drill bit. And then this, being your very small and super sharp, being made out of carbide, then you can remove the weight from the underneath of your solid rim balance wheel that way and it does a real nice job. Something like that and of course in real life they've got a slight taper on them up there. Um, and then the uh, exit stone. A little more like this. This angle from here to here in the old 18,000 beats 103 degrees from here to here is 115. So if you had the pallet stones out, you could make sure, you know, you got the, you had to make sure that you got them back in the right position. And speaking of that, maybe talking a little bit about the different shellacs or attachment procedures that people use. Um, I know that uh, when I first started messing with the escapement in school, we had that flake, the, the flake shellac. And you'd get that small piece and you'd have your, where your uh, pallet stone and your arms meet there and you have this little flake of shellac here you're trying to Make sure you don't want to have too much and you don't want to have too little, so you've got the exact right amount of shellac on there and you're taking it from where you're working to get it up to the flame and you're going real slow because if you go too fast, the air blows the piece of shellac off of there, you know. Well, the way I do it now is I just have a big piece of shellac, that yellow shellac, and heat it up in the, the end of it up in my uh, 
uh, alcohol lamp and I just take a piece of pegwood that has a point on it and when that, sh when that piece of shellac is nice and warm on the bottom, you know, if you heat it too fast it turns brown and all that, so you have to heat it to the, 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 right, uh, the right speed. Take that piece of pegwood and just bury it in that shellac, twirl it around a little bit and then pull it out. And as you pull it out, it cools off and eventually it'll break off and you'll have a string, really just a long string of shellac hanging there. Then you can look at that and, and it's going to be tapered because it's going to be thicker while it's up at the point and, and very narrow where it finally separates from the, the hot shellac. And you can come back with your tweezers and you can snap that off where you think you have the right amount or the right thickness of shellac. So then you take your pallet fork and you warm it up. And when you, I, I'm one of these guys that count steps when I, you know, I'm downtown walking up a hundred steps, you know, wow, did you know there was a hundred steps there or whatever, you know? So I always count everything. So I got the pallet fork warm and I'm 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, maybe 15, 20 seconds, something like that. And then take the, the, my uh, piece of pegwood with the shellac to it. And, and if you've got too thin of a piece, as you bring your pegwood closer to the, uh, the warmer, it'll droop. You won't be able to get close enough with it. But if you have a, the, right, uh, the, the right thickness there, you can get right on it and just touch it. And that right amount of shellac will suck right off of there, and you can get it just exactly where you want it and pull your pegwood away and let it cool, and you're fine. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, the same time you talked about the amplitude, some of the uh, tiny machines that give uh, uh, deep air and neural pressures, what's the typical tolerance for high gain losses at this point? Well, I was, I, uh, the, uh, the question is, I have to repeat this so the mic picks it up. The question is, what's the tolerance in milliseconds on your timing machine for beat error on a high-grade watch? Um, I believe as long as it's one or less, you're all right. 1.0 or less. Um, let's see, oh, then when we were talking earlier about the terms, we talked about dynamic beat and, and uh, or we talked about static beat, I should say, which is when, it's, when the, the escapement has no power on it. Dynamic, of course, is when it's moving. Uh, let's see, could they be different? What would, what would cause them to be different? Pardon? Lever arm being bent. One pallet actually out a little bit further than the other, which means one lock being slightly deeper than the other. If you don't have a, even locks, you could actually have the, your uh, your uh, dynamic beat could be different than your uh, static. And when and when we talk about uh, dynamic and static, we also have that in poise, too. We talked about the uh, 180 degrees amplitude for taking your, your readings for dynamic poise, dynamic poise, static poise on the old-fashioned poising tools. Okay. Yes, sir. The uh, angle of the top of those pallet stones, uh, is that for the interface adhesion uh, clearance amount? For the ease of putting it back into the the fork itself, because there's a little tension there. Okay, why do they never okay. mention the interface clearance on pallet stones? Okay, the first question was the purpose for the, the back cut, correct? Yeah. And the second question is, again? The interface clearance for adhesion. Because oh. if it's zero, you have nowhere to go. So how, okay, let me just make sure I got the question. So how far should the stone fit into the pallet? No. Width of the stone in related in relation to the interfaces with the slot. With the slot. Exactly. Yeah, because really you're just using the meniscus formed by the shellac. Okay, some of the older watches you're you're talking about how the pallet stone fits in the slot. In other words, when you have that clearance, for instance, 
if you're going to epoxy something and and you have zero clearance, just enough to slide, you're not going to get full adhesion. But no one ever mentioned that relative to pellet. Okay. Well, the, the, the so okay. I, I let me see if I can put this in a in, you have to in have space for the adhesive to be in. Yeah, but really the only space that you're going to have once the stone is pushed up into the slot is this taper and this part right here. Right, exactly. Most of your adhesion comes from the amount of shellac that is on top of the stone and overlaps onto the frame of the pallet. Okay, so you're relying on the meniscus primarily. Correct. Well, you're if you're still not not pretty totally in, you've got the back The back half, half exactly right. Black. Exactly right. Now, if you put your stones in, of course, now, you know, when you're, when you're positioning your pallet stones, and the, and the pallet is laying on the warmer, say this is the thickness of the, of the frame, your jewel's always thicker, like that. So you also, besides the view that I showed of the shellac there, you've also got it like this. Okay. Now, what if you, it, some ideas, because you have to be careful when you have to adjust those pallet stones, either to, to remove the shellac, what's the best way to remove the shellac? Alcohol. Alcohol is the best way to get rid of the shellac. Well, if we, if we, mm -hmm. Personally, I like to use fresh. I mean, you could just heat it and slide, but I mean, if you heat it and you try to move it and you can't move it right away, the shellac sets up again. So you get the shellac off. Um, theoretically, it sounds all right, but the jewel might be loose, and then you got opposition. Whereas if you just keep on moving, though, you know, you know you're moving. You know I think you have to look at the job and see. I mean, I can see like in some of the old pocket watches where you might have some slop in the way that the jewel fits, but the uh, 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 the reality with the, with the, I think you're going to have enough tension to, to hold it. Yeah. That's the way I've always done it, yeah. But now we want to move that stone. We have the shellac off and we want to push that stone out a little bit. It's not, the, we don't have deep enough lock. You don't want to use anything metal because you can chip the stone real easily. So I always have a, excuse me, piece of peg wood that usually has some sort of a, dealy like that shaped in it so I can kind of cover the stone and gives me a little bit of control pushing back. Sometimes you say you don't really want to use any metal. There's also the time when, well this is a little longer like this, when it fits so tight in there and you got your stone pushed all the way back, there's nothing you can do but take like an old black oiler or something that's been busted off and right, make a flat edge to it and stick it down here and just wiggle it a little bit to get that stone coming back out. But you want to try and use pegwood whenever you can to keep from uh, damaging the stone. One other thing I just happened to think about related to the escapement, how many, uh, how many certified or certified master watchmakers do we have in here? Any? Certified master? Certified master? Certified master? Okay, great. You probably remember on the written exam, there's some questions where they say, what if you take and push the R stone in, how does it affect the total lock on the L stone or something like that? Oh, thanks, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Try to. Let's see. Yeah, if, you, if you've taken any of the certification, watch certification exams, there's some questions on there pertaining to if you push the R stone in, what effect does that have on the drop lock or the total lock on the L stone? Does it, make, does it increase it? 
decrease it, the slide, you know, whatever. They want to know what, what it could do. And it, it really bothers me because the way I understand the escapement, all that stuff takes place automatically. I mean, if you have your, your uh, equal four corn clearance, your equal guard pin clearance, your equal total lock and safe total lock, drop lock, slide, total lock all take place automatically. And the idea is, is if you're being real concerned about the efficiency of the escapement, then you back your locks off, your total lock off as much as you possibly can so that you still have safe. And that's the best that escapement's going to operate. You know, it's not going to get any better. So I never understood trying, if you had a pallet stone that you felt you had a little bit of lock that was, it was too much on one side and you pushed it in, what was the effect going to be on the opposite stone? Because I just, uh, it, I just don't think that way. So, but since it is on the test, well, I'm turning that the wrong way, aren't I? Uh, I like to try and, and get people to, to, to understand what it is that, that's going on with the escapement when we do that. So, boy, I wish that was a separate whiteboard. Um, we have a, if we have a, uh, our R-stone set for lock, or just say it's set, the moment of let off, the moment it lets off the pallet stone and the pallet uh, and the escape wheel tooth, boom, right there, it lets off at that point and the roller jewel is exiting the fork slot, this space right here is your corner clearance, okay? We have drop lock here, and you can't really tell, but we're not up against the banking pin, so we're not, the slide hasn't happened yet. And then when slide does take place, we're up against the banking pin. I guess it was up against the banking pin. And then that means that the, the uh, lock between the uh, pallet stone and escape wheel tooth is as deep as it can get, and, and total lock has taken place. Now, if we pull this stone out, how does it affect drop lock, slide, jewel pin clearance, and total lock on the L side? If you pull it out too far, it won't escape. Either. Right, if you pull it out too far, it won't work. But if we just pull it out a little bit, what happens is, is it lifts the pallet fork so that the fork slot and the shank is closer to the banking pin. If we pull this stone out, it means it stays in contact a little bit longer so that it can get a little bit closer to the banking pin before they separate. So that means that the corner clearance of the jewel escaping the uh, slot increases a little bit. And then since this, the pallet fork was able to get closer to the banking pin, means that the jewel has gotten deeper into the circle of the escape wheel, so drop lock increases. But since we're closer to the banking pin, slide decreases. And then when we get to the banking pin and total lock takes place, total lock stays the same. Because the only way you can actually affect total lock is either by moving the banking pins or pulling the stone out. Okay, so since we didn't do either of those, total lock can't be affected. So then if we were to come back to the opposite side again, say we push the L stone in. We pulled this one, correct? If we pull a stone, the, uh, uh, it affects the opposite. What it does is affects drop lock and total, or it affects the drop locks. And so by, if you push the stone in, it's going to, if we, well, let's just talk through this one. We push the, uh, the L stone in, that means that the fork slot is not going to get as close to the banking pin before the roller jewel escapes the fork slot, which means that the guard or that the uh, corner clearance is going to decrease. The drop lock, this jewel was not able to get as deep into the escape wheel, so drop lock has decreased 
just like the corner clearance. <clears throat> the fork or the shank is further from the banking pin when that takes place. So therefore, slide increases. And then total lock's going to stay the same again because we didn't do anything to the jewel. The jewel and corner clearance. Okay. Not the total. Right. The, okay, so let me see if I can repeat the question. So the answer the, to my original question was is that it only affects the uh, corner clearance and drop opposite slide the, the same, correct? If you push the stone in, that means that the slide is going to uh, increase. If you push, then it's total lock's the same. If you push the stone in, corner clearance and uh, drop lock decrease. <clears throat> and I remember when I was in school, at Gem City West, I think you went to Gem City, didn't you? They gave you that sheet that had the, the R stone, L stone. Let's just see here real quick. Um, whoops, that's a light switch. They had a couple of those uh, Barkus models, and they had this sheet that had uh, like pallet stone up here, uh, and then action, and then the result or something like that. And they had to had them divided. And then they take. Then they had uh, R stone, uh, L stone. Let's see, is that right? R stone, L stone. And then they had. Uh, or no, it would say. Okay, it would say. Over here, it was the act. It was total lock. Slide. Wait a minute, let's get this in the right order. Drop lock. Slide. Total lock. And then uh, jewel pin clearance. I think it was just JP. Clearance. Okay. So then it would give you a situation and it would say, okay, uh, push the push the R stone in. Okay, and then it had all these different situations. The next one was push the L stone in, and then it was pull the R stone, pull the L stone, and then if you push both stones or if you pull both stones. And they gave you this chart, and this was all blank, and then they give you the Barkus model and say, okay, go, go study the escapement. And you end up memorizing. I mean, you finally, eventually, after looking at all this, you understand, you know, what's going on. But for me, it was like, where's the connection between that and, and timing or that and the efficiency of the watch or whatever? There was never that connection of what, how that, you know, how they actually uh, worked. And so then when I went to got into teaching and like I said the, the students asked some of the darndest questions well then we just started drawing the escapement and that made me a whole lot more familiar with what the different terms and things like that were and why the clearances were such that they should be uh, but it really wasn't until I went to Wostep and I just simplified it with the, the four corn clearance, guard pin clearance, total lock and safe lock and that bingo everything else just falls into place. So. Any other questions? Okay, thanks for your time. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.